And he says these words, peace be with you. He says, peace be with you. Listen, his, his, the disciples, they were in, they were in the home. They were, they had their doors locked. They were afraid. It kind of sounds like today, right? People are in, the, are in their homes. They have their doors locked. You know, they're afraid. They don't want nobody coming in. They don't want nobody going out. But Jesus came into that home. And these are the words that he said. He said, peace be with you. And as he spoke, it says, he showed them the wounds in his hand. He showed the nail prints that were in his hands. And, 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 and his side where he was pierced. Jesus was pierced in his side and he showed them the piercing. And it says that they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. Peace be with you. These are the first words that Jesus said. And I want you to know that he is saying that still today. His words are ringing out, peace be with you. Peace be with your family. Peace be with your children. And it says, when they saw the Lord. And I want you to know today, church, we need to see the Lord. We need to look up to God this morning. We need to not look at our circumstance. We need to not look at our finances. Don't look at your bank account. Don't look at your job situation. Don't look at your family uh, uh, turmoil and, and distress, but look to God. Because this is when they saw the Lord again. Jesus said, peace be with you. Amen. And I pray this morning that the peace of God will be upon you. That the peace of God will rule and reign in your mind and in your heart. We're going to open up the service this morning in prayer. And if you have a prayer request, amen, we want to lift it up to the Lord this morning. We want to believe God to do the miraculous. Amen. I encourage you to pray. Pray wherever you're at. Amen. Pray in this place. Church, now is the time to pray, not play. But now is the time to pray, to come before God, to humble ourselves and say, Lord, we need you. God, we need your presence. God, we need your power, Lord. Lord, we need you to move in our life. We need the peace of God today. So wherever you're at, join us in prayer. And I believe that God's going to touch you in this place. Church here with us this morning. Amen. Pray. Let's pray. Let's come before the Lord and let's get a hold of God this morning. Father, we come before you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, God. We ask you, Lord God, that you would move, Lord, in this place, God. That you would move in our lives, God. Move in our families, God. Lord, touch the hurting, Lord. Touch the lost and the broken, God. Show us, Lord God, where the lost are. Show us, Lord, give us eyes, Lord, to see the hurting, Lord. To see the broken, Lord God. Those who are cast down. Those who are dealing with depression. Those who are bound by spirits, Lord God, of alcoholism. Those who are bound by drugs, Lord God. We find that, Lord God, the spirit, Lord, of witchcraft upon this nation, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that you would move in this land, Lord God. Pour out your spirit in these last days, God. Touch our sons and our daughters, Lord God. Lord, let prophecy come forth, Lord God, through your children, Lord. I pray, Lord God, for healing upon the sick, God. Lord, touch those who are sick, Lord God. Those who are dealing with spirits of infirmity, we rebuke them in the name of Jesus. We take authority in the name of Jesus. And we rebuke, Lord, pestilence, plagues, Lord, diseases, God. We ask you, Jesus, that you would give us the peace of God that passeth all understanding. We pray, Lord, bless each and every one that is here. Bless those that are watching, Lord, those that are tuning in, God. Let your Holy Spirit fill them, Lord. We give you praise and glory for this service. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We've got a, a, a couple... Um, we're going to have a video, amen, and, and also we're going to be doing a special uh, this morning, a special song, but amen, and if you're uh, joining us right now, hallelujah, we want to welcome you to Victory Life Church, amen, we're so glad you're with us this morning, amen, we know that God's presence is here with us, amen, we believe that God's presence is with you as well, amen, God's presence is with you.
Hallelujah. Um, this morning we have the opportunity uh, to give, and, and so there is a post um, for on the Facebook, and we have uh, now we have the uh, the ability uh, for each and every one to uh, give by text messaging. Amen. We know that everybody loves to text message nowadays, and so praise God, we made that available to you. And if you'd like to give uh, this morning, amen, we encourage you to give, amen, because the word of God says that God loves a cheerful giver, amen. And he, you know what? Like I said earlier, we don't look at, at the, the economy around us and the things around us. We, we don't base our decision on giving on that, but we base our decision on giving by God's faithfulness. By God's goodness, because we want to be obedient to the Lord. We want to be obedient to God. And so you can text the word give to this number 719-212-1344. Again, all you have to do is text the word give to 719-212-1344. Amen. And if you're giving this morning, amen, we thank you. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate it. We believe and know that God will bless you for your giving. And I just want to pray a blessing this morning over your finances, over those who give, those who, who uh, purpose in their heart to give. You know what you say? You know, I want to give. I'm just, I'm just afraid. You know what? Fear not. Amen. Peace be with you. That's what Jesus said. Amen. So let's pray a blessing over the tithes and the offerings this morning as we give. Father, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for this day, God. Lord, we ask you, Lord God, Lord, that you would provide, Lord, and meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory that are in Christ Jesus, God. And Lord, we don't store our treasures here on earth, Lord God, but we store our treasures in heaven, God. And I pray this morning, Lord God, that you would continue, Lord God, to pour out your provision, God. I pray for doors to open, Lord God, for in businesses, Lord God. Lord, for doors of opportunity, Lord God, for, for finances, Lord God. Those who are struggling, Lord God, financially, Lord, do a miracle, God, in their life. Show them, Lord, that you are the, the Lord, our provider. And I thank you, Lord, as you bless the gift and giver in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you for your giving this morning. Praise the Lord. We're going to show this video. Amen. Hope you enjoy it.
Uh, can't wait to see you guys again, chase you guys around the children's church, have fun with you guys, and uh, we'll be praying for you guys to get uh, take this time and, you know, like Miss Amy was saying, uh, get closer to God and uh, be a blessing to your parents' lesson. Uh, I don't know, just have fun. And I guess we'll get we'll see you guys here. We'll be praying for you guys to uh, just wait for to be excited to come back to church. And uh, we thank you guys for this video that you guys sent us. And I think that's it. And, 
and his resurrection was for our victory as well. And so this morning, just because we miss you and we love you, we're uh, just going to pray this blessing over you and your families. I believe it's a, a word for you and your children. Amen.
Because it's, it is the greatest victory in all of the universe, in all of eternity. There's been no greater victory than Easter morning. Amen. I call it Resurrection Sunday. It is where death was defeated. Amen. Where life wins. And it's, a, it's not just a, a victory uh, where death is defeated. But it is where God brings life. And I want to minister a little bit about that this morning. And uh, I want you to pray with me right now, wherever you're at. We're going to pray that the Lord will open our ears to hear what he wants to say to us. I believe this morning the Holy Spirit wants to speak to people directly. He wants to give you a, what we call a rhema word. It's a Greek rhema. is a word that God speaks to you personally. And I believe this morning the Lord wants to speak to you personally. And I want to pray that our ears will be open to hear what the Lord wants to say to us about our life, about our family, about circumstances. Amen. Um, and so let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us today. That, Lord, the Spirit of God would speak to us. The Spirit of the Lord would, Lord, open our ears to hear today. Open our eyes to see what you would show us, Lord. I pray against all darkness in our lives. I rebuke every lie that the devil has planted in the hearts of men and women. I pray this morning let those lies be exposed and uprooted. May we receive this morning the truth of the word of the Lord. And may that truth set us free. And may it bring your life and your light into our life. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, amen, whether you've got your uh, paper Bible or your digital Bible, amen, open up. To the book of John chapter 11 verse 25 you know Easter is about restored hope Easter is about life it is about the greatest battle that ever had commenced in all of the universe Satan had done everything he could to stop the plan of God to stop God's purpose and everything was falling into place for the devil but then God moved and raised Jesus from the dead but you know we all know the Easter story pretty well resurrection Sunday but I want you to think about the story leading up to Easter the story leading up to Easter you see, Easter is really a story. And it's not just a story of Jesus, but I want you to think about you and I today. You see, you and I are his followers. We're following Jesus. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of the Lord, I believe that the reason you're watching is because the Lord is reaching out to you and drawing you to be his follower. He's saying to you, follow me. That there's no one greater to follow than Jesus Christ. And here's the disciples, and they've been following Jesus for three years. Some of you who are watching are like me. 
uh, and you've been following the Lord for 30 years or more, some 40 years, some 20 years, some 10, some 5, some 1. But you and I all have a history in following Jesus. And I want you today to relate to the disciples in the story. The story today is the disciples. And we need to go back a little bit in time into the history of the early church. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. His followers, such as Peter, James, and John, and Judas, and, and uh, Matthew, uh, just to name a few, they're all from Israel. And during this time, the Israelites are under the Roman rule. They, they are not a free people. They're not. They're under Roman rule. But yet, they're hoping for the promise of God restoring the kingdom to Israel. They, they read the stories. Uh, do you remember when? Do you remember when David was king? And do you remember when uh, Israel was free and they won all of these victories? And, and they, were, they believed that the Messiah who was coming was going to restore the kingdom. They believed that. And they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was going to restore it. So I want you to think for a moment. Uh, these guys must have had a lot of conversations. Could you see them conversing, you know? I mean, what do you think it's going to be like when finally all of the religious leaders and all the people accept that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah that God has uh, uh, told us about? And they begin to think about how that Jesus was going to be crowned the king and uh, that he would overthrow uh, the Roman rulers. And, and uh, you know, they, they, they read stories in the Bible of what the kingdom would look like. They had a lot of hope. And they had reason to hope because they saw Jesus raise the dead. They saw Jesus give sight to the blind. They saw the Lord do miracles and signs and wonders that no other prophet in all of their history had ever done. No one had ever done anything like Jesus. Yes, uh, there were some uh, like uh, uh, Elijah who had raised someone from the dead. There were others that had done some type of miracle. But no one had done miracle day after day after day after day. In one day, Jesus performed more miracles than Elijah and Elijah did in their whole lifetime. And they were, they were excited. So I want you to think about this. In fact, they were so excited just days before they were arguing who's going to be the greatest in this new kingdom. So they were filled with hope. These early disciples were filled with a lot of hope. I bet you they had a lot of dreams, you know. You know how everybody in 2020, beginning of 2020, everybody's got all the, whoo, man, this is going to be a, a year of great blessing, and we're going to see God do some great things, and, and then the coronavirus shows up and just kind of throws everything, you know, upside down, topsy-turvy, and we kind of all excited there. It, it kind of reminds me of when a couple gets married. Have you ever seen when somebody, when they get married, how, I mean, the future is just bright, isn't it? There's no married couple standing, facing each other. You know, there they are, holding each other's hand. And they're not thinking about, I wonder what it's going to be like to pay mortgages and rent and car payments and working overtime. What, what do you think about that? They're not thinking about that. They are filled with dreams, hope, vision. Future. That's kind of like everybody at the beginning of 2020. You know, it's a new year. We're filled with all of the visions and the hope and the dreams. Just like these disciples were. They're, they, they're all of that. And But then, here's the story. Days leading up to the what we the Bible calls the Passover week. The Passover celebration that the Jewish people were celebrating about how thousand years earlier, actually more than that, uh, uh, 1,500 years earlier, how Moses uh, uh, told the people that if they would take the blood of a lamb and put it over their doorpost and their lintel, uh, that, that the death angel would pass over them. 
They're celebrating this and they're getting ready to, to do that and they're looking forward to it. But just days before this, this uh, uh, feast of unleavened bread, they call it, the Passover happened, they're, they're the, they go to this place of, of Mary and Martha and Lazarus because they heard that Lazarus had died. Now Jesus shows up and he performs his greatest miracle. Here's a man who's been dead for three days and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out and people are freaking out. They can't believe this. And then shortly after that, Jesus is walking into Jerusalem with his disciples. And it's called the triumphal entry. Everybody is shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. And they're throwing their jackets on the ground and palm leaves. And, and you know, it's Palm Friday, you know. And there it is. They're, they're doing all this. And it's the triumphal entry. And, and man, it's hope. It's, it's the fulfillment of what's about to happen. They can tell, they believe, amen, that there's an there's a excitement in the air. In fact, the, the religious Pharisees and Sadducees even said, let's not mess with Jesus or try to kill him during the Passover week because they feared the crowds. They thought, let's just kind of go, you know, deep state right now. We're going to take it and uh, we're going to hide a little bit. We're not going to do anything. So the Pharisees were even pulling back. Many of them said they, they even quit testing him because he was answering them so good that they just, that it was like, okay, we're kind of giving up. And so the disciples are seeing all of this. The resurrection of Lazarus, the triumphal entry, the religious opposition is backing off. The crowds are bigger than they've ever been. I mean, Jesus, it's like, this is it. How many have ever had that in your life where things, you know, you just, you've been praying things through and you're believing God to do something and it seems like, man, you know, you're finally, you know, hitting on all eight cylinders and then something happens. And it's like the devil comes against you and he blindsides you. It's like, uh, man, we finally got, uh, you know, uh, our finances are in order. And then the engine blows in the car. Yeah, I, I, I know what that is. I think everybody does. I remember years ago when I was pastoring my first church in Dallas, Texas, and it was me and Anna and uh, our two girls at that time. And uh, we went to conference. We drove from Dallas, Texas, all the way to Colorado in our little Mazda 626. Amen. I can remember praying, Lord, give us a safe travel there with no problems and bring us home safely. And so we got the conference, and I'm telling you, man, it was powerful. You know, I've been out, I've passed from my first church, I've been out the, the, the ministry, and I've been beat up, and I'm feeling down, I'm kind of hopeless. And I go to conference, man, and I, I'm telling you, I got pumped up. You know, I, I felt like Arnold Schwarzenegger, man. I was, I was pumped. I was, you know, I'm going to go back to Dallas. We were uh, pastoring in uh, the suburb of Garland, Texas. I remember thinking, I'm going back there, and we're going to, oh man, devil, you better watch out. And man, we're we're driving home, and we're excited, and and man, we don't, we we get into town that night, and my car starts acting up a little bit, like we're losing you know, power. And I'm like, what's going on, man? And I pull into a gas station. I can't figure anything out. So I said, well, let's just get home. So we get home. By the time I drive in to the, to the house, that car won't go more than 30 miles an hour. I get up the next morning. Man, praise God, we got home. Where, oh, that's right, the car. We got a problem. Let me go find out what's wrong. I go and they tell me that the head gasket blew and and warped the head, and I need to replace it. It was going to cost me like $2,500. I, I, I mean, it, not, it should have just been $25,000 because I didn't have it. And instantly I come home full of power and faith, and the devil blindsides me. And I can tell you it took me two months Two months to fix that. I had to do it all on my own. I had to buy a used engine. I had to replace it. I had to drive my rotor rooter van to church. I had. I, I was working for a rotor rooter company, and uh, 
And I remember getting Anna, she was pregnant at that time with, with Anna, she would get into the stinky rotor rooter van and we'd get five gallon buckets and turn them upside down so Andrea and Melissa could sit back there next to the rotor rooter machine. And they would say things like, Daddy, your truck stinks. Yeah, it's a work truck, baby, but it's getting us to church. Here was the pastor of faith and power driving up in my rotor rooter van, getting out, getting my little family out, and I had lost all hope now. I'm like, oh man, I, you know, it, it was just, de it was deflating when that car broke. And I've had story after story where I can tell you that has happened many times in my life, and I know that everyone here has stories, where right when you think, man, we got a triumphal entry. Something happens. I know with married couples that happens sometimes. Married couples, oh man, things are doing good. Seems like, man, we're just getting along great. And there's no reason for any, any conflict, but something happens out of the blue. It's a demonic assault. The devil is attacking your relationships. And when there's no rhyme or reason for it, there's an argument that happens. There's a fight that happens. There's some, it's a big blow up. And, and it seems like, a, man, we're not going to survive this one. Or it could be your finances. It could be any number of things. It could be your, your, your passion. How many times have Christians, you, you man, you just, uh, you're passionate. You're, man, you got your fire going. You're on fire for God. You're, you're excited. Something happens, and it just quenches that passion and fire. And you know, it's almost there have been times where you've been in a church service, and the Holy Spirit's trying to stir you up, and that thought comes in your mind. I've tried that. I don't want to do that again. I, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm at this settled end point. I don't really want to be rekindled because what happens if I lose, I get hit again? I've talked to people over the years who said, I don't want to ever pray and fast again because last time I did, all hell broke out against me. I've had Christians who said, you know, I don't really want to step out in ministry again because last time I did, man, I tell you what, if my, if my family got attacked. And, and, and I want you to know that this is what happens. This is what the Easter story is about. It goes from raising Lazarus from the dead to the triumphal entry to the great crowds in the temple surrounding Jesus and him doing many miracles to finally betrayal, disappointment, defeat, death, loss. And from that triumphal entry, Palm Friday, to the next Friday, it all was gone. You see, what happened is one of Jesus' follower, Judas, betrays him. The disciples run. They can't even stay awake and pray with Jesus one hour when he's at his most vulnerable, when he's, when he's, I mean, he's exceedingly sorrowful. He's praying, God, if there's any way, Father, this cup can, of, of suffering can pass from me, let it pass, but not my will. You're... And then he goes, hey, guys, hey, can't you at least watch with me for one hour? He's already told them that they were all going to flee, and Peter's bragging, not me, man. I got your back, Lord. But how many know that Peter not only fled when they arrested Jesus, he then later that night denies him three times. So here's the whole story. From triumph to tragedy. And now Jesus is taken by the uh, religious leaders. They're, they're slapping him around. They're, they're mocking him. They take him to Pontius Pilate. Pilate doesn't even want to uh, uh, deal with it. But he's forced into it. Next thing you know, Jesus is being uh, whipped He's being mocked. His beard's being pulled out. They're putting a crown of thorns on his head. He's now taken across. And I, I think the disciples watching this from afar. And they are defeated. 
the followers of Jesus were defeated. I don't know about you, I'm a follower of Jesus. How many have ever felt defeated? You know, some of the most defeated Christians of all are those who have been saved the longest. Those who have been with the Lord the longest. You see, when you're a young Christian, when you're a young believer, you're full of uh, hope. You're full of uh, dreams. You have an innocence about you. You're in your, maybe you're in your first church. You're part of a church body, and, and there's an innocence. You think, this is like heaven on earth, man. Look, this is my loving family and friends, and we just love the Lord. And, and, but let me tell you something. Over time, man will fail you. People will fail you. Your brothers and sisters in Christ will fail you. Sometimes they will betray you. Sometimes they will disappoint you. And what happens for older Christians many times is that we become cynical because we've been through so much. We quit trusting people. We quit trusting uh, spiritual leaders. or we quit, We've been hurt. I mean, it's like somebody's taken us and just run us through the ringer. And I want you to know this morning that the, the, the Easter story is a story of hope. It's a story of resurrection. Because in the midst of all of the disappointment with the disciples, with all of the letdown, with where it looks like there had been betrayal and defeat and disappointment, loss, everything has been lost. The disciples were hiding out but thank God for those women in the church. Amen. Marys, they get up, they're going to go and uh, to the tomb. They want to check on the body of Jesus and apply some things. And, and uh, they get there, and all they find is an empty tomb. When the devil has done his best, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. When the devil has done his best to destroy your marriage, to wreck your finances, to rob you of all your hope, to, to make you cynical, to, I mean, just to, to take your passion, your fire, your zeal, your, your dreams, whatever it may be, when the devil's done his best, if you can believe in Jesus Christ, if you can believe in the power of God, God can resurrect all the lost, all of the things that have died. He can bring it back to life. Because if he can bring Jesus Christ back to life, he can bring back anything else to life. Amen. And that's what Easter is really about. In fact, John chapter 11, verse 25. <clears throat> 11, 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. If you can believe in me, though you may die, though may something in your life may seem dead, I can make it alive again. Because Jesus is the res resurrection and the life. I want you to think about that word resurrection. The word resurrection means a standing up again, a restoration to life, raised from the dead. It is something that it's a power that begins to restore to life something that is dead, a restoring to life. And as I was praying about this and about what I should preach this morning, I just felt that with everything that's going on in the world today, everything that's happening, amen, it's not just the, 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 the coronavirus and people being out. I'm talking about everything that's going on. There is so much 
hurt. There is so much loss. I see it even in Christians where they're struggling in marriages. They're struggling with addictions. They're struggling, amen, with, with, with loss of, of family members, lost relationships, broken relationships. They're dealing with depression. It doesn't matter, it seems, these days, whether you're, you're, you're following Christ and you're a believer or you're not. It's like we live in a world, man, that seems to just to be falling apart at times. And I believe what the Holy Spirit began to speak to me is, tell my people I'm still the God of resurrection. Tell my people I am still the God who can resurrect the dead. In fact, we read this, uh, amen, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 16 through 23. And in Ephesians, I love this verse, amen. And it's where Paul is praying, and he says, hey, listen, I, I want to pray for you, the church. And he says, I'm not, I don't cease making mention of you in my prayers. And he says, this is what I pray, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you may know and he says i want you to know three things i'm praying that god will give you all this enlightenment and, and revelation so that you may know three things what is the hope of god's calling number two what are his riches for our inheritance as saints God has a lot of riches, and he says, I want to know what, you need to know what your inheritance is. But number three, listen to what this one is. This is the, the, the great one. He says, I want you to know what is the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. He said, I want you to know what is the exceeding greatness of God's power that works towards you. And this is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. God wants you to know this morning, he's the God of resurrection. He's the Lord who raises those things in your life that seem to be dead. He raises them to life again. Maybe today you have lost hope. Maybe your hope is dead. Your hope is down. God says, I can give you hope again. Whatever you've lost hope in. You may have lost hope in your marriage. You may have lost hope in your, your health. You're tired of it, man. You can't even deal with the pain anymore in your body and, the, and all the doctor's Reports that are always negative, and you're like, I, I, don't even, I don't even know if I've got another year to live. I want you to know something. God can resurrect that hope. Amen. Because when he raises up hope and he restores hope, it resurrects faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's, it's what we're hoping about. It's the evidence of things not yet seen. And so maybe you've lost hope. Maybe you've lost faith. How many want that to be resurrected today? If Jesus, on this day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, now I don't know about you, man, but when someone is dead and in a tomb, it, I, I don't go around thinking, uh, I think they're just going to pop out of there. I think they're just going to walk out of there. If you've ever been in a hospital where people are dying, if you've ever been to a funeral where someone is dead, there's no hope for life. Listen, even as a Christian, I believe that there are times people have been raised from the dead, but they die again. Did you know that? Jesus was raised from the dead and never died again. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he died later on. Why? Death is the enemy of mankind. That's why the Bible says Satan, who is the thief, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to bring death. Isn't that what God said in the beginning? Why we shouldn't sin? He says, don't eat of that, of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
The day that you do, surely you will die. Death is a part of human life. Death, and I'm not just talking about physical death, spiritual death also, but death of hope, death of dreams, death of a vision, death of passion and zeal, and a desire to even do something for God can die at times. Marriages die. Relationships can die between children and their parents and siblings. Death is all around us all the time as humans. It's everywhere. It happens. It's a, we're constantly fighting death, are we not? Are we constantly fighting death? Why do you think that the world is so enamored with this whole coronavirus? It is a battle of life and death. Everyone's looking at what are the numbers for those who have died? Who is dying? Is there hope yet for a vaccine? Is there hope yet for a medicine that can help somebody? We are always enamored with life and death struggles because we, every day you get up, is a life and death struggle. It may not always be, hey amen, you're struggling to stay alive today in the physical. You listen, when, when, when you're young, you think you're invincible. You start getting a little older, and you start figuring out, you know, I may have this many years left. That, that thought crossed my mind this morning, just driving here, you know, I'm kind of thinking about things, and, and I'm thinking, how many years would I have left? Let's see, you know, I'm 53, I'm going to be 54 later this year. Man, if I, if I live to, to 90, that gives me like 37 years left. 37 years? That doesn't seem that long. I started to get a little depressed. Thought, man, that's not right. Amen. How many, you know, but that's the world you and I live in. We are not promised to live to 200, 300 years old. Amen. The average life, amen, is around 80, 85. And that's not even promised to you. We are surrounded by life and death. But I want you to know something. It's worth fighting for life. Don't give up. The only time death can actually take a hold of something is if you quit resisting it. Don't quit resisting death and loss in your life. As Christians, God said, let me show you. I want you to see the worst of the worst. My son was crucified. He was betrayed. He was rejected. Some of you have gone through rejection, betrayal. You can, lo you can lose faith in people. There's a lot today, listen. There's a lot of people today who are no longer a part of a church body. But they still believe in Jesus. They still love God. They don't go to church anymore. And the reason is because they've lost faith in people. They've lost faith in the body of Christ. They've lost faith in spiritual leaders. They've been hurt. They've been betrayed. Some have been molested. All kinds of things have gone on in the name of Jesus in the church. There's no church body or family that's going to ever be perfect. But I do believe without a doubt, this, this is for certain people today. The church is still the plan of God. It's still his plan with all of our warts and shortcomings and brokenness and ugliness, the church is still the plan of God. And maybe today you have lost a belief in the church. Your, your belief in being a part of a church is dead. Maybe this Easter Sunday the Lord would resurrect it. Restore it to life.
Because I want you to know the church needs you. The church needs your gifts. It needs your love. It needs your spiritual experiences. God is going to, listen to what I'm saying, God is going to begin to fill his church with young believers, new converts. We're going to see, I believe, in this coming year and years, we're going to see a great harvest of new believers. A lot of young generational X and or Z, they call them Gen Z, and a lot of millennials are going to get saved. A lot of young people. And I want you to know, for all of you older Christians, many of you who have given up on the church, you need to come back. Because they're going to need, those young believers are going to need you. Your giftings, your love, your compassion. And we need to allow the Holy Spirit to raise to life and restore to life some of these things that are dead. Some of you have gone through divorce. Some of you have gone through broken relationships and those hopes are dead. Some of you are facing divorce. When I was in prayer this morning, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me there are going to be people who are watching today that you are facing divorce. You feel like you have no hope in that marriage anymore, that it is, it is worth, it's worthless. And God is saying to you, and the Holy Spirit will, to, will quicken this to those who need to hear this. But he's saying to you, I want to raise to life again that marriage. I want, I said, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. And if there's, if, if, if there's not been any, uh, uh, you listen, Jesus said, if there is uh, a sexual immorality uh, in that marriage, that's, that's a reason for divorce. And I believe if there is physical abuse in a marriage that's gone on, there is a reason that you can be divorced. But many people are getting divorced because of arguments, of disagreements. I don't feel I love you. Uh, you. I'm angry with you. And let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit is saying to you today, what God has put together, let no one put asunder. God says, I can resurrect that marriage if you'll let me. I'll, I'll resurrect it if, you, if you'll let me. If you'll come and say, God, I need you. I need you to resurrect my love. For my spouse. I need you to resurrect in me, Lord God, a, a heart of forgiveness. Some of you said, I'm not forgiving anymore. You, you cannot do that. You've got to let the Holy Spirit resurrect within you and raise to life a heart of, of flesh to where you would be forgiving of others. Don't be hard-hearted. God can take that dead heart and raise it to life again. He says, I'll take out a heart of stone and put in you a heart of flesh. There's some of you that you have been battling in your health. And I mean, you just feel like, I, I don't even have any hope. I, you, some are young and you feel like you're going to die in the next couple of years. I want you to know something. God wants to heal you. He wants to restore your health to your body. But you're going to have to feed yourself on the word of God and build up your faith. And know that God is the God of resurrection. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead can raise your health, can restore health to your body. Amen. And there's others, amen, that you've been really, you've lost the call of God. I, I think of Peter in this. Peter, after denying Jesus three times, he still has lost the call. Where, where do we find Peter? Back in Galilee, fishing, where Jesus found him. And Jesus shows up on the shore of Galilee, and he's making some fish while Peter and James and John and some of the other disciples are out there fishing. And Jesus says, hey, y'all caught anything? No. Throw the nets on the other side. They do, and they get this great catch. And John goes, ah, oh, it's the Lord. Peter jumps in, swims to shore, gets there, and Jesus restores Peter. He restores him. He restores, he says, Peter, I want you to know the call of God is not, not gone. It's not dead. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I do. All right. You need to feed my lambs. What was that? The call of God. Peter, I've got a, there's a reason I called you. I need you to feed my lambs. 
Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. See, that's where I see many people today, they've lost the call of God. The call of God, the, the purpose, the will of God seems to be, to be dead in you. And God says, I want to resurrect that back to life. I want to raise that back to life. And many of you are like Peter, and, and, and it seems like it's dead. There's a resurrection of the hope of God, the call of God. Vision, purpose, all of these things God's saying, I want to bring it back to life. I want to close with this. We, I want you to know why many things in our life has died. One reason is because we live in a world that is controlled by death. Listen, I, I've been married... Wonderful marriage, amen. I tell you, uh, me and my wife have been married for 36 years. But you know, we have to fight for that marriage. If I just put it in cruise control, the marriage relationship will naturally die. It's, you, you have to, it's like planting. How I many know weeds you don't have to plant? You don't have to water weeds. I, they just grow. That, I, that's, there is a picture of life on planet Earth. Weeds will grow on their own. But you want beautiful flowers. You want good harvest. You want tomatoes. You want some jalapenos. You get to plant the seed. You have to, you have to you know, till the ground. You have to water it. You got to fertilize it. You got to baby it a little bit. You got to get the, all the little rabbits out of the way and all the animals that want to eat it, you know, and, and you, got to, you, got, you have to take care of it. You see, many times love can die in a marriage because no one's cultivating it. Because we live in a natural world that death reigns. So many reasons that things have died in our life. That's why the love of many will grow cold. That's why you can become lukewarm or why you can lose your first love with Christ. Why is that? Because many times what happens is that we, we're just living in the world. We're not, we're not uh, adding anything. We're not protecting it. We're not cultivating our walk with God, our love for Christ, the, the church relationships, the marriage relationship. And I learned a long time ago, if my marriage was going to last, I'm going to have to cultivate. You've got to deposit into that marriage. And still, you can deposit, you can cultivate, and you can do things. And instantly, in one day, the devil will just blindside you, and you'll feel a disconnect with your spouse, or you can get into you get into an argument, you can get depressed about that marriage. Why? The devil just comes in with death and says, I'm going to attack it with some death. You have to rebuke death. You have to rebuke death and prophesy life over things. So just because we live in a world that is it's natural, death is the natural course of this world that you and I live in. You need to cultivate life. Cultivate your walk with God. Cultivate your faith. Cultivate, amen, that marriage. Cultivate, amen. Add to it, fertilize it, water it, pray over it. If you don't want death, in your children's relationship with you, cultivate it. On purpose, you have to be intentional. Intentional. I made some mistakes. I'm not, I'm not a green thumb. So we planted in our backyard over the years all kinds of things. We planted trees. We planted flowers and, and bushes. And, you know, I can remember the first time I started planting, we planted some little evergreens. Evergreens. If anything should stay alive in Colorado... It's evergreen trees, right? I plant them in the same ground that other evergreens are living in my backyard. They, they've been there naturally. I live right the, you know, where the bluffs are. And, and th so I'm thinking evergreens. I plant them there. I water them. I put this, you know, the, the hole and the fertilizer and, and, and everything. And then the next year, they're dead. They're browned out. I'm like, what happened? They got the same rainfall that these other green trees had. What happened? I didn't cultivate them. I didn't, I didn't go up there and water them enough. Now, every time 
I mean, just this week, I'm already out there watering my trees that have been planted for three years. I'm like, I'm, I'm giving them water right now. I don't want them to die again. I am tired of failing, amen, at trees in my backyard. I was telling my wife the other day, I, I was counting how many trees have died in my backyard. Sometimes it's because the deer come and they start rubbing the bark off. Amen. And so the devil will come and he'll, he'll, he'll try to, you know, kill you. But sometimes things die naturally because we don't cultivate. Now, the second reason things die is because of our sin. The Bible says sin brings death. Our sin will try to bring death to all things. When we don't obey the word of God, you can be a Christian, you love the Lord, but you're not obeying his word. It'll bring death in your life. It'll bring death to, to many things. And But here's the good news. Easter was about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where death was defeated because the blood of Jesus had been shed. And now Jesus gives us a miracle cure for death from sin. It's called repentance and faith in the blood of Jesus. When you and I say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I repent of my sins, I confess my sin to the Lord, you release the resurrection power of God over whatever you repented about. See, when I was a sinner, when I wasn't following Christ, when I prayed and asked Christ, he resurrected me. Therefore, if any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed. I was a new Adam. I, I mean, I was a totally different person. It was amazing. I, was a, I, I, I had a different mindset. I, I saw things differently. I wanted different things. But then over the years, there are many times where you are allowing sin in your life or in a relationship or in a circumstance or in your finances. You need to repent and let the blood of Jesus bring healing and resurrect to life the things that are dying. I want you to pray with me this morning. We're going to pray. First thing I want to pray is I want you to pray and release the resurrection power of God over your life. Whatever you feel needs to be resurrected, to be raised to life, to be healed, to be restored. I want you to begin, right where you're at, begin to pray over that. I want you to just begin to pray for that marriage, for that relationship, for your children, for your health, for your finances, for the, the call of God in your life, for your passion, your zeal for the Lord, amen, and, uh, your faith, your hopes, whatever it may be. I want you to begin to pray, God, I need the power that raised Jesus from the dead. I need that same power to work toward me today, Lord, and begin to raise to life these things in my life that are dead. Be specific. You begin to call Call them out. You begin to speak them specifically. Amen. In just a minute, we're going to pray, and I'm going to be praying with you. Others, you're here or you're watching, and you're not saved. You're not serving the Lord. I want you to know your life can be raised to, to your, your life, which is dead. You're dead in Christ. You're dead in the flesh. Amen. You can be raised to life in Jesus Christ if you'll pray and repent of your sin. Maybe you're backslidden. You've gone astray. You quit serving God. You know what? All you have to do is come back like that prodigal son did. Say, Father, I've sinned. I've sinned against heaven. And re renounce that sin. Ask for forgiveness and you'll be saved. Amen. Wherever you're at, I want you to just begin to pray with me. Amen. And we're gonna, it's like opening up the altar. And if you're here uh, this morning, we have a few people who are here, uh, a part of the uh, ministry team. And you're welcome to come to the altar right now. Let's stand together. Amen. Uh, and those who are home watching, whatever you need a miracle for, I want you to begin to pray with me right now. But we're going to come, and this altar area is open at your home. You can kneel down and pray. You can stand there and pray. But let's begin to pray. Father, I come before you in the name of of Jesus Christ and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I rebuke the spirit of death I rebuke the power of death 
off of our lives. I rebuke the spirit of death off of our hope and faith. I rebuke death off of marriages and relationships between family members. I rebuke death off of our health. Lord, I rebuke the spirit of death right now off of uh, our finances, Lord God. I rebuke death, Lord, off of our emotions, Lord God. Many who are dealing with emotional battles, Lord, we rebuke death right now. But today on Easter Sunday, in the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ who was raised from the dead and now sits at the right hand of the Father in the name of Jesus which is the name above every name I release life I release life over marriages I release the resurrection life of Jesus Christ over every person every need in our life Lord God I thank you Lord that you're Lord bringing life and hope to broken people people who have had a hard life Lord God they have no hope for a good life I release Rebuke that lie of the devil that they cannot have a good life. I speak over them today. Hope, Lord God, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ be released upon you. Be released upon your family. Be released upon your body. To be released upon your spirit. To be released in your circumstances. May the power of God and his resurrection power be upon you. If you need to salvation i want you to pray this prayer with me and repent and ask christ to come into your life say lord jesus i believe in you i believe you are the son of god i believe that you died on the cross for my sins i believe that you have been raised from the dead and i believe that you went to heaven and you're coming back again one day and I today repent of my sins. The sins that I have committed. That have brought death in my life. I turn from them today. I renounce them. And repent of them. And ask you Jesus. To cleanse me with your blood. To cover my life. And resurrect me. Bring me to life. In the name of Jesus. Bring life to my circumstances. Bring life to my family. Bring life to me. For you are the resurrection. And the life. And I believe in you Jesus. Amen. Amen. Take time where you're at to pray. Seek the Lord this morning. Just begin to call on his name. We're going to sing a worship song right now. And as we're singing, you can join in. But if you're at home, just continue to seek the Lord. Call on the name of Jesus. Speak, prophesy over your circumstances. Prophesy life. Life over that marriage. Maybe you have a spouse that wants to divorce you. Speak over him or her. Speak life over them. Speak the love of God over them. If you've got health issues, uh, speak life over your body. Command the resurrection life of Jesus to your body to be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We give you all of the glory. Oh, yes, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. I prophesy life. I prophesy life right now over marriages, Lord. I release resurrection life over marriages. I release resurrection life, Lord, over those, Lord God, who have quit the church. They've given up on being a part of the church. I speak and release resurrection life over them, Lord God. Oh, to have faith in what you have given your life for. For Jesus, you said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I release life over families that are broken. I release life, resurrection, restoration, Lord God. Lord, to people's finances, Lord God, to, to Lord's circumstances. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we worship you, Lord.